So it's a pleasure to introduce today's speaker. He's a professor of entomology at UC Riverside. And that's me. So I'm going to be talking about constructing wetlands, thus improving water quality, jeopardize public health. And this is an overview of the talk, so I'm going to start out by highlighting some of the benefits and draw, drawbacks of constructive treatment wetlands. Briefly talk about some integrated mosquito management strategies for wetlands, wetland design, and food web manipulations, and then highlight some of our previous work from case studies. So it's clear that uh, based on some recent ANR publications, that some of our work needs to be re highlighted. So I'm going to talk about trophic interactions and surface flow. Constructed wetlands, treating municipal wastewater uh, from the San Jacinto wetlands we studied, and then three case studies one on vegetation management, grotto wetlands, planting design in a couple of places, and then uh, trying different macrophyte species, uh, both here at the ag station and at grotto wetlands, and I will wrap up. Okay, so in the West, um, Whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. That quote is attributed to this guy in the upper right there, but in fact, he never said it. That's Mark Twain. But if we look at uh, water supply to West Riverside County, you can see that you know, we rely on water that's transferred down from the Central Valley, now through the Central Valley, um, through the California Aqueduct, and we rely on water that comes from the Colorado River. A third important source of water for us is groundwater reservoirs that sit at the base of the transverse range of mountains. So we're clearly in the desert, um, and a lot of our mosquito issues are our own making, as are the mosquito issues in the Central Valley. And we then rely on either groundwater and or recycled water as an important component of water management strategies in the Southern California. If we think about what we've gone through fairly recently, California has sustained a long period of drought. Uh, we've heard about foodborne illnesses, namely uh, pathogens that have contacted the food supply primarily from agricultural um, feedlots, for example. And then we have communities that are trying to deal with total maximum daily loads in terms of how they treat the storm water. And then here in the lower right, uh, there's an increased emphasis of utilizing constructive wetlands as a means of treating water that's gone through uh, agricultural uses. So, for example, tailwater that ran off the fields was typically pumped right back into the source, in this case, a river. And uh, increasingly, there's an interest in incorporating constructive wetlands into that treatment train to reduce the nutrient load uh, that's discharged from agricultural fields back into natural systems. So in terms of uses of constructed wetlands, many of these wetlands have been built for multiple purposes. The water quality improvement or water reclamation is the primary usage of constructed treatment wetlands. Um, habitat replacement and mitigation to mitigate wetlands losses due to development and say constructed wetlands have been built. Wildlife conservation is another use, education and research, Recreational activities um, down in Southern California, some of these wetlands are used for recreational duck hunting, for example, and then as amenities to development. As it turns out, and probably not surprisingly, that it is very difficult to achieve all of those goals at the same time. That uh, in more and more examples, these wetlands are capable of achieving one of those goals, but certainly not achieving them simultaneously. There is now renewed interest in constructed wetlands to reduce flooding associated with increasing storm intensity. So if you believe storm intensity is associated with climate change, um, there in the upper left is Houston after Hurricane Harvey. This is the Houston and George Bush International Airport after Hurricane Harvey in Houston. Um, this is New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And this is Beijing, China, where they had between 2011 and 2014, 62% of their modern cities have been subjected to flooding, resulting in over $100 billion. So the idea then is to build constructed wetlands as a mean, means to accommodate these floodwaters. Um, 
So um, what urban planners are now focusing on is unengineering, what they call unengineering strategies to provide ecological security for these urban areas. So this, uh, this slide illustrates one approach. So what you have is stormwater would run off the street through this drain into a bioswell, and presumably as long as that bioswell doesn't clog, that water will infiltrate and be treated as it infiltrates into the groundwater. So that's great as long as there's not pooling of water on the surface. An alternative approach that some of the uh, urban designers are advocating is one that looks like this. So in fact, you're har harvesting stormwater and using it for non-potable use, but you're creating ideal mosquito habitat right there in the center of uh, an urban area. Another unengineering strategy that's being utilized, particularly in Southern California, is to remove the floodwater work, so these cement hardscapes, and replace them with what you see on right there, which is designed for the LA River to replace floodwater channels with a more natural situation than folks who take advantage of recreational areas. That too would be fine as long as you don't have cooling on the floodplain. You're probably going to get black fly production along with this water as long as it keeps moving. But you can see you're putting water into the habitat, which potentially creates mosquito habitats. And then another approach, as I said here, is a swamp by any other name. It's called low impact development in the United States, green infrastructure in Europe and Australia, or sponge cities in China. So over the last five years, the Chinese government has advocated the building of sponge cities. So this picture in the upper left is an example of a sponge city, which is going to handle stormwater and floodwaters. And you can see that there are places with standing water, wetlands that are adjacent to an urban area. This is another example of that, Kavan Lakes in Russia. So you can see that there's inundated vegetation here that sits right at the periphery of an urban area. And then this is another example in China. So this is a fairly recently um, designed and built structure, but you can see there's um, a pond there holding water. Eventually that will get filled in with vegetation and presumably it could become a site for mosquito production right adjacent to an urban area. Crazy ideas aren't limited to overseas. This happens to be New York City. So this is the island of Manhattan. This is Central Park, and this is a proposed redesign of the Meadowlands complex that sits to the west of New York City. So you might not get a lot of freshwater mosquito production out of that site, but you certainly could get a lot of salt and marsh mosquitoes coming out of that site. And it's right adjacent to a major metropolitan area. So um, this is a recent publication from the University of California for the Agriculture and uh, Natural Resources Division. And uh, this is a publication that advocates the use of constructed wetlands to treat stormwater discharge. And one of the things that is noticeable about this particular publication and any of the others that are related to the technologies that I showed you previously is that in this case, despite the previous publication in the ANR by folks um, cautioning against the production of mosquitoes by treatment wetlands, um, they're not even incited. So there's no mention of mosquitoes in this publication, despite the fact colleagues have published. So as a spouse and a father and an instructor in the university, one sort of acclimated to people not listening to so much <laughs> The other thing about this publication is it advocates these open water wetlands, which they look like this soon after you build them, but that doesn't last very long because they will become filled in with emergent vegetation and have the potential to produce quite a few mosquitoes. So if we look at the, the two general types of wetlands, and there are permutations of, of each of these, so the flow regimes could differ, and the matrix, the matrix in which plants are planted differs, but the two general categories of constructed wetlands are subsurface flow patterns. So in this case, you have a matrix that sits, presumably uh, the water sits below the surface. You have plants that are uh, taking up nutrients 
and the water is running through there and being treated as used in the matrix. And these sort of wetlands are very expensive to build. We really don't have a good idea for their lifetime of these things, so how long do they last before they clog? But it is the best approach for treating wastewaters that carry high organic loads or high nutrient loads. So to keep the water below the surface so that you don't generate cooled water for mosquitoes. The most, uh, I would say the more common approach is to use what is called surface flow wetlands. So these are essentially marshes that utilize emergent vegetation. So this is us collecting fish in one, and you can see the extent of this emergent vegetation. It's anywhere between 10 and 15 feet tall. And these wetlands can provide a cost-effective approach to improve water quality. So these are some of the three of the sites that we've worked in. This picture on the left is the Prado wetlands. It's 142 hectares. It treats half of the water moving through the Santa Ana River. So the water flows into the wetland and then down to the center here and then out. And it improves water quality for pennies on the dollar. So the amount of nitrate coming into this wetland in the summer is about 10 parts per million and you cannot detect it going out. It's a wetland, as I said, it's large, it's 142 hectares, it's over-designed, and it's a, a very cost-effective way to improve water quality. So that water is run back into the Santa Ana River and then moved to Orange County to infiltrate uh, groundwater basins, reducing the nitrate load in that water by about half. This wetland in the upper right is another one we've worked at in San Jacinto. It treats municipal effluent. It's on the order of about 10 hectares in size. And the third site that we've worked at is this one in India, which is a six hectare wetland that also treats uh, municipally treated wastewater. Both of these are treating wastewaters that have gone through only secondary treatment. So while these wetlands have potential benefit for water quality improvement, sort of wildlife improvements so that the riparian bird species, endangered species, live in the riparian zone here, very effective for increasing those populations uh, from essentially single digits to over several hundred mating pairs of spells vireo, for example. It's great for mammals, not so great for native fishes and native amphibians. So one of the serious drawbacks of any of these habitats is the potential for mosquito production. These habitats take advantage of large macrophytes. They're planted in the wetlands. So pictured here are two species of bulrush that are commonly planted, the California bulrush and the hard stem bulrush. These have different annual cycles, um, and uh, that's important for denitrification processes. Uh, other macrophytes that are used in these wetlands include the common reed, and that's less so in, in Southern California, and cattails, for example. So these macrophytes serve important functions in the wetlands. So some of the things that they do are illustrated in this slide. They reduce the flow and mixing to enhance sedimentation. So they slow down water movement that promotes sedimentation particles from the water column. Particles actually absorb onto the plants themselves. So they're reducing particular concentrations by material gluing itself to the plant surface. They reduce variation in environmental factors. So for example, temperature variation during the day within vegetated zones is comparatively small variation in daily temperature regime as opposed to comparatively more open water. These are typically shallow, so they're on the order of one and a half feet to two feet in water depth. Importantly, these plants provide physical structures for the microbes that do most of the water quality. So they provide a physical matrix on which these microbes are attached. And these microbes are doing most of the water quality improvement. They uptake and store nutrients. So anywhere from 60 to almost 80% of some of the nutrients that's absorbed or reduced in, in water is absorbed into these plants, plant material. Of course, what the plants take up, they also give back. So when, when they, uh, for example, in the winter, when they die back, or when some of them die back, they actually these nutrients into the water. And there are instances where you can get more nutrients leaving these wetlands than are coming in, even though you're treating municipal wastewater. So the potential of these plants to put nutrients back into the system, if they're managed correctly, is significant. They oxygenate the sediments, so translocation of oxygen through plant materials around the root zones, so they create a narrow zone around the roots that's oxygenated, 
And importantly, they enhance the nitrification. And they do that by maintaining a zone of reduced oxygen, dissolved oxygen within the plant, uh, inundated plants. So that is great for mosquitoes because they breathe air and they don't care. But many of the things that eat mosquitoes need that dissolved oxygen to uh, exist in the habitat. The nitrification, then, what you're doing is it's, instead of incorporating that nitrogen into biomass or incorporating it into the substrate, you're converting it into dinitrogen gas, for example, and blowing it off the wetland. And that would be a very effective way of reducing nitrogen concentrations. But there are problems associated with the large emerging macrophytes. One is that as that vegetation fills in, you find increased levels of mosquito production. You reduce the effectiveness of abatement measures. So David's here today, so David can take a nap on this bull rush and not even touch the water that's underneath. So there's no way that you're going to get current formulations of larvicides through thick vegetation cover like this. There's reduced wetland performance for improving water quality. So as I mentioned, these plants take up nitrogen, they take up nutrients, but also give those nutrients back. And then there's a high cost of management. So if you bring these guys in to harvest that vegetation and then remove that floating vegetation, it's pretty expensive. So for example, to remove about three hectares of vegetation using these guys, it's about $150,000 pop. And if you had to do that more than once a year, you can envision that. It becomes pretty expensive to manage these weapons. This picture in the lower right is something that uh, wetland managers wanted to do to enhance denitrification. So the idea was to provide organic carbon for the microbes to enhance the denitrifiers. But when you do that, you create soup that produces lots and lots of mosquitoes. So that is contraindicated for mosquito control. And in fact, in wetlands that are treating fairly high, uh, high quality water, such as tertiary treated municipal wetland, you don't need um, that amount of organic carbon to keep things going. And you certainly don't need it if your organic carbon is coming into the secondary. So the generalized strategy or scenario of wetland succession is illustrated here. You fill in, uh, you dig a habitat, fill it in with organically enriched water, you get macrophytes developing along the periphery, and then you might get a couple different stable states in the water columns. So you might have uh, algal production that's primarily important, or you might get uh, floating macrophytes. Eventually that fills in. So as that habitat fills in, mosquito production increases, and your ability to control those mosquitoes declines. So the efficacy of biological control agents and naturally occurring predators declines as those habitats fill in, as does your ability to apply, to apply environmentally control, control strategies. Another important thing to keep in mind is that the geographic area potentially affected by mosquito production is much greater than the area circumscribed by the wetlands water surface. So here's an example of a mark recapture study that we did in San Jacinto Valley. Um, it's got two species of mark with fluorescent dust, Culex thorax and Culex tarp, tarsalis. This left, these figures on the left, illustrate all of the individuals that were collected in circular trap arrays that extended out from that wetland. And then the two panels here on the right illustrate the marked individuals. So you can see in the case of erythrothorax that the marked individuals pretty much uh, were represented by all the individuals in the collection. So the erythrothorax that was being produced in this wetland, although they didn't move very far, so this is uh, 23 kilometers, 23 square kilometers, those individuals did not move very far. The wetland, the treatment wetland is the primary source of those mosquitoes. In the case of Culex tarsalis, there appear to be three sources in the valley. There's a northern region here which has ag irrigated agriculture. There is a camping facility here that has a wetland associated with it that produces Culex tarsalis. But overwhelmingly, most of the Culex tarsalis in that valley is being produced by this treatment wetland. And these are the marked individuals that were marked on the wetland and released. You can see most of them are captured around the wetland, but they are moving out on average at a distance much greater than erythrothorax, and they move to the edge of the grid within a couple of years. So they can move pretty far within a very short period of time. So when we look at that wetland aerial view, so this is the wetland 
The red circle here indicates the average distance moved by Qx and Qx, which is on the order of about half a kilometer. And Qx Carsalis essentially moved to the end of the edge of that grid and within three nights was moving outside that grid across the valley. So the idea would be to control those mosquitoes in the wetland while they're concentrated in that area and don't get out across the landscape. The other thing that's happening is the land use patterns are changing. So this is the wetland was built in 1996. You can see it's primarily surrounded by agriculture and by 2018, human development has metastasized into the right side of this. So human development is encroaching on that wetland. And this means that uh, the reservoirs for these arboviruses that are associated with the wetlands, so the birds that are on that wetland, are um, some of the reservoirs for arboviruses. So you've got transmission among the birds in the wetlands with Qx tarsalis, for example, and those tarsalis populations then would potentially disperse out into the surrounding suburban area and contact birds with the very good amplifiers of arboviruses. So house finches and house sparrows, for example, are very good at amplifying arboviruses. And you have the potential then for an arbovirus outbreak by uh, these mosquitoes that are dispersing off the wetland and into the surrounding neighborhoods. So how might we control these mosquitoes? An approach would be uh, integrated management approach would include, uh, or the, the mantra should be design wetlands, design mosquitoes out of the wetlands as much as possible. So you can use a variety of strategies when you design these wetlands to reduce the propensity of the wetlands to produce mosquitoes. So you can design the basin, have topographic configurations, so you can incorporate deep zones, for example, within the wetland. You could have hydrological control where you're potentially trying to move that water out of emergent vegetation into deep zones, so you're essentially stranding those mosquitoes or bringing them out into open water with high levels, levels of mortality. How you manage the vegetation is going to be important, and how you design, planting design that you utilize is going to be important as well. The macrophyte species, as I'll show you in a little while, is, uh, can be important in terms of reducing mosquito production, or causing mosquito production, depending on which species you use. And then another approach is to reduce allochronous subsidies, so either treat that water in some way chemically before it comes into the wetland itself, or to build in four bays, so essentially a large open habitat where you can get some sedimentation taking place and reduction of some of the uh, nutrient loads that are coming in in the waste water. And of course, if none of this really helps you out, you have adjuncts to wetland design, so you can utilize biological control, fishes, larvivorous fishes that eat mosquitoes, in this case, are bacterial larvicides that are being applied by helicopter or by truck. Um, I get asked by a lot of people why we're going to build a bat box and put it on the wetland and that's going to help control the mosquitoes. It's great for the bats, but it doesn't do a darn thing for mosquito control. So if we look at the abundance of Culex mosquitoes produced in habitats of different loading rates of organic matter, what you put into a wetland matters. So um, this is, these are four types of wetlands sort of uh, illustrated here. And what I plotted is the abundance of mosquito larvae in dip samples across time. You'd be hard pressed to call it dairy wastewater. Yeah, you can get development on the periphery. But essentially, that wastewater lagoon is producing mosquitoes throughout the entire year. So these are some data from a study by George Mira and his associates in Florida. And as long as they're pumping wastewater into the wastewater lagoon, you're getting gobs and gobs of mosquitoes. A second area, a second approach would be utilizing a wetland for stormwater treatment. So for example, you might have a grassy swale in which floodwaters are deposited for about a month or so. There's usually enough material in that, in that grass, organic material provided by the grass to run that wetland for about a month. So you get a peak in mosquito production and then bottom-up forces essentially decline. As do colonization, as does colonization by predators, so you just get a peak in mosquitoes and then they disappear as the water levels disappear. In contrast, treatment wetlands, such as those that are receiving secondary treated municipal effluent, you have large numbers of mosquitoes as long as those, mosqui those adult mosquitoes are active in searching for plants. And so in this case, Felix tarsalis becomes active in April, active throughout the summer, and enters reproductive diapause in the second or third week in October. 
and you have mosquitoes in the wetland as long as those adults are uh, an active for, uh, seeking blood news. A fourth approach would be rice fields or treatment wetlands. So in this case, a wetland that's treating tertiary treated effluent, so it's got low organic loads. You can see that the abundance of larvae in those habitats are typically much lower than you would see in a wetland that, see, that is receiving secondary treated effluent. And you might get a vernal and autumnal peak of Culex tosalis and a midsummer peak of Anopheles in these habitats. So let me just briefly talk about a case study, in, in this case, uh, treatment wetlands in San Jacinto. So as I said, this wetland's receiving secondary effluent. So it's got five inflow wetlands. So the water's coming in, tips of these wetlands. So it's a wetland pond wetland system, so that water flows through an open pond and then out to uh, outflow marshes. And if you look at the production of QS mosquitoes in that wetland from July to, July to September, um, and there are two species of vegetation there, so one is uh, Shemplectus secutus, hard stem bull rush, and the other is Shemplectus californicus. This is the estimated mosquito production, so the billions in terms of what's coming out of those two uh, emerging macrophytes in that wetland between July and September. Most of what's coming out of there is illustrated uh, here is Culex erythrothorax. So the three primary mosquitoes that are found in this wetland are Culex erythrothorax, Culex rosalis, and a small number of Culex quinquefessi is right at the inflow. But predominantly this wetland is producing uh, Culex erythrothorax. Now these are based on emergence trap samples you don't get every emergent mosquito when you're running emergent traps. So the studies we found that you get about 80% of a cohort of mosquitoes uh, in an emergent trap. You then model that for continuous production over time. We typically run these emergent traps for about four days. So we're actually collecting about 50% of the mosquito production out of that marsh at that particular time. So if we correct these numbers for that, is uh, this wetland is producing between July and September about 680 million mosquitoes. That is in a place where there were no mosquitoes produced uh, two years previously, and that represents about 60% of the annual mosquito production from the wetland. So on an annual basis, this wetland is producing over 1 billion mosquitoes um, in a place, as I said, where there was no mosquito production previously. That production is tied to the vegetation types and, and the nutrient loading. So in this case, you have mosquito production, emergence as a function of time for the five inflow marshes, and then the two outflow marshes. There are two inflow marshes that produce comparatively more mosquitoes. The other three inflow marshes, and those are illustrated here. In this infrared photograph, you can notice the dark, this brownish appearance. That's, that's Xenoplectus cutis, and this pinkish color Shenoplectus californicus. So the, the acutest marshes tend to produce more mosquitoes than the californicus marshes, and the inflow marshes produce comparatively more mosquitoes than the outflow marshes. Now, if we ask what is the relationship between detritus that's produced by those bull rushes, the, uh, the autochthonous algal production in the wetland, and then the stuff that's coming in in the municipal wastewater, and ask what of those resources are primary resources, feeding the two mosquitoes, these are the two bulrushes, and these are sewage-derived particulates and algae, so this is the carbon isotopes and nitrogen isotope, and these are the signatures. When we run uh, mixing models for those, you can see that Culex erythrothorax is primarily algal in its signature, suggesting that it is feeding primarily on paraphyte and it's growing on the tulips themselves. The common name of Culex erythrothorax is the tule bird, is the tule mosquito. Not surprisingly, it's tule density has increased, so does mosquito production. Culex carcellus, on the other hand, appears to be tracking stuff that's coming in in the municipal effluent. So the signature of newly emerged adults is that of sewage derived organic matter and a little bit of the bull rush detritus. So Culex tarsalis can respond then to the material that's coming in directly from the wastewater treatment. Um, what I want to illustrate here is that most of what's coming into this wetland demands oxygen. So this is 
the nitrogen series uh, in the first three years of operation. Nitrogen, nitrate, nitrogen in green, nitrate, blue, nitrogen in blue, ammonia, nitrogen in red, organic nitrogen in yellow. You can see looking at this that most of what you see there is uh, red and yellows. So that for every uh, mole of nitrogen that goes through, you're going to take about four moles of oxygen. So it, it's a pretty oxygen intensive process. In terms of mosquito production, when that wetland was uh, first flooded and the bulrush was planted on about one meter intervals within those inlet marshes and outlet marshes. Most of the production was low. Sinculex parcellus is shown by the, uh, the yellow diamonds and then the red circle of Culex and thorax. Not much production in the first year. In the second year, production, if you integrate the area under those curves, production increased about sixfold. In the third year, which is shown here, so the graph I just showed you is, is here on the left, those two peaks on the left, groups of peaks on the left, production increased sixfold again. So we're getting nearly 35,000 when you add Rithithorax and QX Tarsalis to those per CO2 trap per night. That's a huge amount of mosquito production for this well. And these are the color infrared aerials of, the photo of that wetland. So the first year it's mostly open. It filled in within a year. This was supposed to have a 10 year lifetime before any vegetation management was required. And by the third year, there's not much change in terms of coverage. About 80% of the water surface is covered by emerging vegetation, but uh, production increased markedly. Um, larval counts show the same trends so low in the first year, increasing in the second year, and even higher in the third year. Interestingly, the herbivorous and detritivorous insects responded similarly, and that production increased between two and three fold uh, during those first three years. And in contrast, the predators did not increase market. So there appeared to be a disconnect then between the change in resources that were coming into that wetland and predators. If you look at the nitrogen series, so the N15 series, that would be indicative of who's eating whom. So this is the rank order of the nitrogen signatures of various organisms in the wetland. There are the nitrogen signatures for QX and the thorax. Animals that are eating those insects are going to be somewhere within this range, between uh, three to six parts per thousand. And the primary predators then are beetle larvae, notonectids, bell stomatids, and dragonflies would be the primary organisms that are eating those mosquitoes. This is a study that was run by George Peck, in which uh, we were running four different treatments. One was a no fish exposure treatment, one was a fish enclosure with low fish densities. This is a cage control, so it's a three sided cage that's open, and then treatment open in the wet. So you can see when there are no fish around, you get lots of mosquitoes and con contropic organisms such as phytoxins. You add fish, those levels essentially decline. And in the open wetland, these hemipterans seem to be playing a big role in terms of reducing the abundance of mosquitoes. Um, we tried different planting regimes or different designs. So this, this is a comparison of the mortality rates of two designs. This is a, a single phase wetland where it's a, a marsh, single marsh, and then a three phase met wetland where you have a marsh, open water, and a marsh. And these are mortality rates based on a vertical life table model for one phase marsh shown with the filled symbols and the three phase marsh showed by the open symbol. Both of those marshes are responding similarly, so the slopes are homogeneous for both of those treatments. There's a marginally significant somewhere between 0.05 to 0.1 in terms of marsh type, but you can see that there's considerable overlap, but predator abundance in terms of invertebrate predator abundance is causing significant mortality, or is related to the mortality that we see in the mosquitoes. When we rear these mosquitoes in cages in the inlets and outlets, so this is an inlet, um, cages in the inlet, cages in the outlet, and then a reduction of the amount of resources that are available for those mosquitoes, you can see survival is pretty good when they're at full strength water in the outlet, and the size of wing lengths of, of mosquitoes are pretty comparable on both inlet and outlets. And when you reduce those resources, you reduce the size of the adults and you reduce survival. 
So what, what that means is that in, in the case of if you've got a development time of about eight days, when you can reach uh, mortality rates of about 0.6 per day in those three phase marshes, you can do a good job of almost eliminating most of those mosquitoes while you'll still get some coming through in the cohort um, in that single phase marshes. So when you build a model and ask what's the relationship between mosquito abundance and nitrogen loading, you can see there's a very good relationship there. So the correlation is about 0.9 between it's the time lag model based on nutrient loading rates and the abundance of mosquito larvae in, in the wetlands. So that nitrogen loading, which is indicative of resource, resources provided by the treatment, by the municipal wastewater, by the water quality treatment, is about explain about 81% of the variation there. So one of the things that happened in this wetland is the performance was so lousy that they decided to open it up. So they went from about 80% um, coverage in, in 1996 to about 50% in 2000. In 2002, they reduced it to 25%. There's not much difference in terms of the amount of total nitrogen, ammonium nitrogen, and total phosphorus in the two designs. The loading rates increased about twice that. The two loading rates in 2000 were about twice that of 1996. So what happened was the mosquito fish were inadvertently introduced. So you had a wetland for the first three years functioning without mosquito fish. And then when you added mosquito fish, what happened? So what happened was that when you added mosquito fish, they didn't do a very good job controlling mosquito populations in the springtime and early summer, but they decreased the abundance of mosquito larvae in, in the late summer and early autumn relative to wetland when there were no mosquito fish. The other thing that happened is the mosquito fish were feeding on clodocerins and they had to eat through the clodocerins before they actually ate the mosquitoes. So clodocerins in the wetland without fish is shown here and then the trend with fish is shown here. So if we ask for the same amount of nutrient loading, what's the impact of mosquito fish or what level of control are we getting? It's just under about an order of magnitude. And so mosquito fish will reduce those mosquito populations by an order of magnitude, but that's probably not enough to stem any outbreak, certainly not enough to stem any outbreak of arboviruses. So in terms of cartoon form, what's happening is the fish have to eat through the clodocerins, then they move through the mosquitoes. All right. Ten minutes or so. So in addition to what you put into a wetland, how you manage that wetland matters. So this is that Prado wetlands, 142 hectares, receiving tertiary treated municipal effluent, so it's fairly high quality water. On average, that wetland produces between about 7.6 and 10 million female mosquitoes between July and September on an annual basis. So the, the production uh, per unit area is on the order of about 0.1 adult mosquitoes per meter square per week. But if you come in and manage that vegetation with this thing, which actually comes in and thrashes it and doesn't remove it, it just cuts it and leaves it floating on the water surface. So you can see this huge amount of dead biomass that's in that well. What happens? What happens is for this, this is where that vegetation management took place. So within that one hectare wetland, Within a week's time, you're producing between 500 million and 1.5 billion female mosquitoes out of that small area of the web. So how you manage the vegetation is critically important in terms of what sort of mosquito production you're going to get out of these webs. We tried different planting, planting designs. So in this case, we're looking at three planting designs where we went in and burned replicate wetlands. And then we had replicate wetlands that had uh, just allow the vegetation to grow back. We had another set of wetlands where we went in with backhoe and thinned the vegetation, removed root balls, and then we had uh, raised planting beds or hummocks. And this is the production, these are the larval abundances during the two years of study. So with the control of the burn only, this treatment, we had more mosquitoes than you did with situations where you had open water. But by the second year, it didn't much matter. These were biased samples in the sense that you've taken 
within the vegetation, it didn't much matter what you did in terms of production from the vegetation. So what was happening is over time, those wetland, replicate wetland cells were filling in. And the scale at which mosquitoes are responding to vegetation is comparatively small. But in terms of overall production, the production in the, in the raised planting bed treatment, because you had more open water, um, in terms of a per wetland production, production was much more cheaper. And that uh, mortality rates were associated with noted nectar, so this happens to be the abundance of immature mosquitoes as a function of the number of noted nectars in the diffs. And you can see that as you increase noted nectar abundance, uh, you reduce the abundance of mosquitoes. And that's a direct consequence of open water. The noted nectars don't like very thick vegetation, they like open water. Some of the other uh, things that we've looked at um, uh, in terms of designing the wetlands would be what would happen if you had thick zones of emerging vegetation versus thin zones of emerging vegetation. So in this case, we did studies in two of the arms of that San Jacinto wetland. We were trapping uh, organisms with floating, emergent, with floating minnow traps and with emergent traps. And we ran transects um, parallel or perpendicular to the board here. So that we didn't create uh, through, or didn't create paths that organisms could move through this vegetation. And we sampled in the open water just outside, 1.5 meters in, 5 meters in, 10 meters in, and then in the center of the narrow zones of vegetation. And the take home message is that these wide bands of vegetation, transects of 1.5, 5 meters, 10 meters, produce more mosquitoes on average than it does a narrow band and particularly open water. So that if you can limit that vegetation to comparatively narrow bands of vegetation, you get significantly less mosquito production than you would in these bands of, uh, within those wide bands of vegetation. Um, although the two wetlands, this is inland marsh one, inland marsh five differed, nevertheless, the story remains the same. These are not different from zero, the narrow and the vegetation and the open water vegetation in terms of mosquito production. So one of the last things I want to talk about is using alternative macrophytes. So instead of using these large macrophytes as Californicus and Chanophytes acutus, we did a variety of experiments where we looked at a small bulrush that only grows uh, between one a meter and a meter and a half in size. And the other thing about this uh, particular bulrush is that it has an annual cycle where everything above the substrate sends and dies off in late autumn. So by spring, when those mosquito populations are getting ready to ramp up, you have open water. So you naturally have open water. So that would allow predators to take advantage of the mosquitoes if they're there um, and potentially reduce the mosquito population increases that occur during the spring. Uh, this is a study that we did over at the Ag Station in UCR. So this is Chanoplectus meridimus, a small one. This is Chanoplectus californicus. And these are the relative abundance then of live stems, dead stems, and dead litter. The first year for californicus, the second year for californicus, first year for meridimus, and the second year for meridimus. So you can see that you get a lot of dead stems in that second year. Um, although there wasn't an opportunity here for this, for water levels to be raised to sink that stuff. Um, and that resulted in uh, less mosquito abundance in the Meridimus than in the Californicus. So there are four treatments shown here. One is Californicus alone, the other is Meridimus alone. And then we built in a sprinkler system where we just ran sprinklers crepuscular. So we, run, we ran them at dusk and we ran them at dawn and that was it. And you can see that there's a significant reduction in the numbers of mosquito larvae in those trees. So the sprinklers are very effective at reducing uh, overposition by those mosquitoes. We do have egg graft counts as well. The other thing that happened is that meridimus is more conducive to endophytic organisms such as dragonflies and damselflies. So there's about a two to three fold increase in the numbers of immature damselflies associated with meridimus than there is in California. All right, so I need to wrap things up. So, um, 
We tried this in wetlands, replicate wetlands in, in Prado. So uh, the idea was that uh, we get limit the production to the vegetation to narrow areas and maintain open areas. And we did that by constructing wetlands with shade cloth and raised planting beds. So these are my $10,000 beakers. Um, and it was pretty effective for the most part, restricting mosquito production to the vegetation that occurred on those raised planting beds and the periphery. The issue that we ran up against is that Shanaplectus meridimus is an early successional species and um, was outcompeted then by a seed bank which had lots of large bulrush in it. So eventually by the end of the first year, much of that meridimus was replaced by these large bulrushes. So one alternative that's being looked at now is to actually do away with emergent macrophytes and focus on paraphyte. The water quality improvement that these folks are getting is on the order of comparable to that with a marsh that's filled with emergent vegetation. So the paraphyte seems to be doing a um, pretty good job at improving water quality without all the downsides associated with emergent vegetation. So let me wrap things up by talking about some conclusions and challenges. First, the production of mosquitoes from constructed wetlands without fish is strongly associated with emergent vegetation coverage and wastewater loading. There's trade-offs between water quality performance and wetland habitat goals. So wetland managers need to define their wetland habitat goals. And if those are conducive to various forms of mosquito control, that's fine. The point is that you're never going to eliminate all the mosquitoes from the wetlands. So what you can do is design the wetlands and manage them to reduce mosquito production. Mosquitoes and herbivorous and detritivorous insects decrease directly with or increase directly with resource inputs, namely the wastewater loading and autochthonous resource production in the outdoor production within the wetland itself. And there appeared to be a decoupling of top-down effects in these hyperneutrophic conditions. So the predaceous insects did not increase appreciably in response to enhanced bottom up effects. We're not sure if you can do pretreatment uh, to reduce nutrients and reduce some of that dissolved. Top down effects by mosquito fish on herbivore and predatory insects can be strong even in hypertrophic systems. They're probably not strong enough to provide significant control of mosquitoes in highly enriched conditions. Controphic interactions, namely the fish prefer to eat zooplankton as opposed to mosquitoes, ontogenetic changes in the dietary preferences of the fish, and poor overwintering survival of mosquito fish in these situations. The overwintering survival of the fish is on the order of less than 10 percent, so it's not surprising that they don't do a good job controlling mosquitoes in the spring. They have to build up their populations before they can exert significant amounts of control. And that's during a period of critical arbovirus amplification early on in the season. The other downside to Cambusia is its invasive nature outside, outside its native range in the southeastern U.S. So let me just thank all the folks and the various agencies that have funded aspects of this research, and I will take the question or two.